Welcome back to the Leafs Nation after dark. I'm Zach Phillips, and tonight we're going to be breaking down game number 67 of the Toronto Maple Leafs regular season, dropping this one here 4 to 3 to the Philadelphia Flyers tonight, moving to 38, 20, and 9 on the season. So during the show here today, we're going to break down what happened, what went wrong, what went right, if there were positive takeaways, negative takeaways, all that kind of stuff. If anybody here wants to call into the show tonight, please feel free. Send me a message on Twitter, Instagram. You can message me on Discord if that's the easiest way for you to do that. If you have me on there as well, we're going to be joined by Carter Hutton during tonight's show. So you are going to want to stick around. So if you're watching right now and you haven't already, hit that like button, subscribe to the channel, turn on notifications so you get notified every single time we go live. Carter Hutton, obviously, as well, appearing across on the Leafs morning take show, Nick Alberga and Jay Rosehill. So good stuff happening here Monday through Friday, 11 a.m. Eastern time, and then right here on the post game after as well. So hit that like button, subscribe here to the channel. But let's get into tonight's game. I mean, if you watch the game preview, we talked about some of the stuff that this Leafs team was doing ahead of time. Mitch Marner still remains out. I saw Car Carlo on the show this morning talking about kind of some growing concerns there with Marner being out. Look, that one is still going to piss me off because as I watch that replay over and over and over again of the Marner injury, I just can't understand why he didn't just shoot the puck into the empty net. It feels like that injury was avoidable. My thoughts on the Marner, on Marner still being out, yeah, it's a little bit concerning, but at the same time, when we're going to look at holding him out of the lineup, Nick mentioned it when he came on the show the other day. He was like, are you worried at all? Or do you, ha you have that feeling like Marner could be coming back? and Marner could come back into this lineup to try to fight to get to 100. I, I think that that has kind of gone out the window now. Like, that that feels like the Matthew 70. That chase is kind of gone. It, we're no longer worrying about that. It doesn't really seem, atta seem attainable at this point. So I think for me, I'm not as worried about holding him out because it just kind of feels like if you do this, you're just going to continue to let him get healthier and healthier and healthier. And reality is we know we're not going to slip out of a playoff spot here when, unless something drastic starts to occur and we start to really fall off a cliff. Like it's, it's not going to happen. They're going to be fine. They're going to be okay. They're going to be in the playoffs. It's just a matter of like, can you catch Boston? I think that one's going to kind of get away from us here as well. And that dream's going to be over. So who cares? On the road, at home, doesn't matter. If you're going into uh, Boston, if Boston's coming to you, who cares? Win that round. Find a way to get it done. You're going to have to go through ups and downs on your way to the Stanley Cup. You're going to have to get lucky. You're going to have to get bounces, and you're going to have to get some health. And the best way to do that might just be to rest a guy like Mitch Marner if he is even the slightest bit banged up right now because... I don't think when you're going to look at Matthews, Marner, Tavares, Nylander, these upper echelon guys in the lineup here that we have, I don't think they're guys who's like, oh, you got to worry about them. Can they be ready to go on the drop of like on the drop of a dime? Like, can these guys just jump into a game? I think you're going to be fine. I, I don't think it's going to be a worry for them. I'd rather hold him out, I'd rather give him the rest, and I'd rather let him come back when he's fully healthy. Uh, so him being out is fine. I look at Simone Benoit drawing back into the lineup here. Uh, Ilya Labushkin had taken a couple of hits. I thought at some point he might be injured from those. Appears to be just illness, so he doesn't play in this game tonight either. I obviously I don't think Benoit should be in for Labushkin. You go and you acquire that guy. He's going to bring very specific things, skill set to this team. Uh, some pieces that you're kind of more maybe missing just in terms of the penalty killing, shot blocking, right handed as well. That being said, I, I watched Simone Benoit out there tonight, and it's almost like shocking to me that we consider we still sit here and have to realize like Sheldon Keefe held Simone Benoit out of this lineup. They bring up the graphic on screen during the game. The best defenseman in terms of expected goals against when he's on the ice per 60 so far this season, Simone Benoit. Like we're talking about playing things defensively, being a defensive defenseman. Simone Benoit has pretty much like checked all the boxes for Leafs fans. He seems to have checked those boxes for Brad Tree Living, the management, the group. Like he's not going in here and being a net negative to this team on any given night. So why is he the first one to have to come out so that the the Timothy Lilligren project can continue as we're pushing for a Stanley Cup? That's what I don't understand. Now, it's a bit of, we don't have to really dig too far into the conversation tonight because, look, Lilligren, I think, played fine. Ben was in, so they're both playing. But the conversation is going to stir up again once you get back from Washington of who plays, who doesn't play, how do you handle this? 
So I'm I'm interested to see, but I don't like I watched Simone Benoit tonight and I thought he looked good. I thought he l- looked good. He was physical. He had a lot of energy. We saw him jumping into some offensive plays, offensive rushes. He was creating some stuff when he was doing that. It was a little bit chaotic. He kind of looked like he had just gotten shot up with some heroin and sent out on the ice and told to go fly around for a while. But I think he looked good in this in this game and in his return back to the lineup. And if we're going to talk about rewarding guys for their play and, and kind of sitting here and looking at, oh, you aren't deserving your ice time, I don't think we could say that reasonably about Simone Benoit. I don't think he has lost the right to have this type of ice time or to be in the lineup on a nightly basis. I didn't think he lost it before, but yeah, you obviously had to fix some, fit some guys in. I just can't believe that we are in year eight of this team, this group with Matthews and Marner and these guys, and we're going to continue to develop projects 15 games from the Stanley Cup playoffs. We're developing projects. Like, why are we looking at, like, this young 20-year-old defenseman and being like, he's got to be in the lineup so he can get his game together? Timothy Lilligren is not going to be the reason you do or don't win the Stanley Cup. Like, he's just an extra cog in the machine. You'd love for him to be going, but he's not the level of importance that Morgan Riley is or that... uh, TJ Brody and Jake McKay bar like TJ Brody he's gonna have to get his shit together because what we saw here tonight as well which is in part on him because he did not play well he did not play well alongside Riley but it's also in part on Sheldon Keefe for for some unfucking known reason deciding in his brain that putting those guys back together was going to be a good decision like it's like the entire world knew those guys should not and cannot play together. You split them up because of the suspension that happens to Riley. Brody all of a sudden starts playing like God. Riley comes back. He keeps them apart. And it's like, wow, this is all of a sudden continue. This, this works now. And then he says, yeah, no, actually, we're going to have to put them back. And he puts them back for like a couple games or a game and it, it doesn't work again. And we sit there and go, well, why the fuck would you have done that? And then he takes them apart and then it works again. And then all of a sudden we come back to this game and he puts them back together and it's a gong show again, like a complete gong show. This was not, oh, they had some bad moments. This was, there were moments of complete, God, help me find a better word for what the what these guys did here tonight because it was a nightmare, effectively. And then we saw him in the third period. Keith did make the adjustment and take them apart. It's just like, he's he, it feels so stubborn in some of those things. It's, it's the most confusing situation ever because we talk about all the time, the blender, the blender, the blender. And the blender can be psychotic because, it, you know, it's like he's in a psych ward here with the blender running so long that in his brain, that's all he's hearing is just the rattling of the blender plays 24 seven. And all of a sudden he can't make these decisions. And I feel like that as the fan base, but there's also parts of it where it's like, he just can't get away from Timothy Lilligren. He has to be in the lineup. Uh, Nick Robertson, uh, this guy has like one bad shift and Sheldon Keith hates him. Like, TJ Brody can stink for 20 consecutive games and Sheldon Keith's, ooh, keep him going, keep him going, keep him going. What the fuck is going on with some of this stuff? You've got the blender on one hand going absolutely psychotic and then you've got parts of the lineup that this guy just cannot get away from no matter how bad they are. Like, it does not matter how bad some of these guys are. I I mean, Morgan Riley tonight... (laughs) I somehow don't know how he escaped with this one with the with the even on the night. He did. He's zero. No plus, no minus. But TJ Brody, minus two. Not good. Not good from him. It, it was like every time it felt like I was watching this game and said, wow, there's a really good chance for the Flyers. Wow, there's a lot of pressure on the Leafs in their zone for a lot of time. Or they, they got hemmed in and, and kind of get their teeth kicked in a little bit. It's like, well, there goes the camera cutting to TJ Brody skating to the bench again. He had himself a rough night. So when we're talking about the level of importance of some of these guys, Brody being getting a lot better here dr- drastically or maybe just being used in the right position is going to be very important to this team. It's going to be very detrimental to come to playoff time because... 
I'm not sitting here saying this guy has to be a Norris Trophy candidate for this playoff run, but I'll tell you what, he can't be what he was tonight and what he has been for the majority of the season if this team expects to have any type of success. He just can't do it. You cannot rely on a guy who's going to A, make $5.5 million. Obviously, I know it comes up at the end of the season, but that's still what he's making. That's a big cap hit that could be spent elsewhere on improving other pieces or maybe another $5.5 million defender, right? Though That money could be allocated in different ways to different players, whatever. If that guy's going to be sitting here eating things up, eating up salary, eating up that uh, your cap, he's going to eat up minutes that Sheldon Keefe's going to put out there. He cannot cannot play the way that he's played for the most of this season. So I don't know if it's deployment. I don't know if it's partners. I don't know if it's matchups and minutes, but this needs to be fixed. That needs to change. He's going to be very important. I uh, And again, I just to kind of tie back, more what I'm saying here is, uh, or what I'm saying as well with the lead into this was just that Lilligren to me is not that level of importance. If he's really good, that's great. If he's not good, take him the fuck out of the lineup. You've got other guys there that can go in. Edmondson has been fine to me. I've watched Edmondson here now, and it's like, he's quiet. I think that's what I'm looking for for my sixth defenseman. Get into some physical battles. He can get that kind of stuff going on. Uh, he, he can win net front stuff. Decent on the penalty kill. Decent in the late game situations from blocking shots perspective. Def- being defensively minded. Fine with any of that. I, I don't have any real issues with him here or there at all. It's the why does Timothy Lilligren absolutely under, like, he has to be in this lineup, it, it, according to Sheldon Keefe, at least. And that is very confusing to me. I can't understand that. I can't understand why he can't get away from it. But uh, interesting nonetheless. There's another thing that I kind of wanted to talk about, uh, and it's bothered me for a long time for what we see out of um, out of this team. I have constantly talk about the fact that we we always go to the Mike Babcock stuff when I've talked about it at least, and it's the idea of starting on time. Start on time. Can you start on time? Are you starting on time? This Leafs team feels like they struggle with that more than anyone. I saw Jay Rosehill tweet during the game here tonight as well. It's like it feels like every time there's these opening draws uh, with the, with this Leafs team, there's an opportunity, and it continues here again tonight. And uh, I, what is it, 50 seconds, 55 seconds into the second period they scored, 19 seconds into the first period the Flyers scored. That's just not good enough, but uh, hopefully here to help us break this down and see how everything's going uh, with – Starting on time, you've seen him here on the Leafs Nation channel. You've seen him across all the other channels that we've got here, part of the network as well. Welcome to the Leafs Nation after dark for the first time, Carter Hutton. Carter, how's it going? Good, good, Zach. Thanks for having me on, buddy. This is a quick hitter for me. Usually I got some time to prep and uh, a little (laughs) more emotional right now. How are you doing right now after that one? Uh, I was excited with the way that it ended. I was pretty frustrated watching like the first 40 minutes. The thing for me was that we knew going into this one, Philly was going to be fired up. It was, it was, well, it was going to be one way or the other, right? It was going to be, they were going to be really fired up or they were going to completely fold, which I think most people did not expect them to have done that given, you know, they sit the captain in in the press box for the game, but it's like, okay, that's fine. Philly's going to do that. You're expecting on the other side, at least the Leafs are going to come out firing or at least ready to respond. And 19 seconds in, you're down one, nothing. I'm sitting there like, well, holy fuck, we could have expected this one. Yeah, yeah, that was obviously a tough start. And, you know, in, some, in hockey as a pro, you always talk about like the first minute, the last minute, or the last few minutes of period. So a horrible start for the Leafs, you know, getting down like that. And then to do it again in the second period is embarrassing for me, you know, because that's yeah. something that goes, you go into the room, you talk about it, you're like, we can't do this, we have to bounce back. So, you know, they hit a lot of posts tonight, they had some chances, the Flyers blocked a lot of shots, but it's one of those ones where you, you look at their captain out of the lineup, someone who... Couturier, you think, can be removed from the lineup. Maybe this is something the Leafs need to see. And just be like, some of these guys just keep getting the game and getting chances, getting chances, getting chances, and they play like shit, and they struggle. And there's 
I, I, I struggle with it a little bit because I feel like John Tortorella is a bit extreme, right? Yeah. The way he handles it. And obviously it kills me that he doesn't have a suit on out there because he looks like an idiot. Um, not that you <laughs> need to wear a suit, but whatever he's wearing is just not cutting it for me. And uh, I, I just think it gets to a point where, you know, I know players are untouchable. It's it's tricky at a sense, but you're trying to win a Stanley Cup. You're trying to make this team better. And I, I feel like we've put guys on pedestals and they make the same mistakes over and over. You look at it. You know, you look at the early goal in the second period where you have your your two star defensemen, you could say, your highest paid defensemen in uh, Riley and Brody just can't even f- handle the puck and get out of their zone, just simple hockey. So for me, it's frustrating to watch at times because you see the other side of it, how good they can be, you know. So it's a late push and, you know, there's a lot to digest after that game. Yeah, well, the, uh, the torts thing is funny to me because every time I look at him, it's like, it, it kicks into my mind that it, like it's John Tortorella who's the one who's wearing what he's wearing. Like if it was any other coach, I feel like I'd just be like, right, whatever. And then I just l- keep looking at Torts like that's the guy who made made this fashion statement in the NHL. Like I'm not wearing my suit. Uh, but yeah, I, I talked about it just before you would come on with the Timothy Lilligren and Benoit thing. Like I kind of want to put the conversation to rest a little bit because we got to see Benoit back in the lineup here tonight. But again, it, to me, it was like I wasn't sitting here saying over and over again wow we need to see more of Lilligren we need to see more of Lilligren and then that was the decision that needed was made public at least by Sheldon Keefe about well we're not taking Lilligren out here because we're we got to give him an opportunity to get his game back together and like well we're 20 games away from the playoffs like we're we're developing guys with pro like using projects at this point that was kind of confusing but just in terms of where where you're at with kind of the lines uh I'm going to go defensively. TJ Brody, Morgan Riley doesn't work all year. We go five games with Morgan Riley sitting in the press box. He's suspended. TJ Brody goes back to the left side, gets a new partner. Looks really good. Looks refreshed. Looks like a, like the old TJ Brody in a sense. He comes back in the lineup and then Sheldon Keefe keeps them apart. Looks good. Flirts again with the idea now all of a sudden where we go into one game, they're back together, and it goes pretty shitty for like a period or two. He separates them. Tonight, we see them back together. I know that there's guys out of the lineup. Labushkin doesn't play. You got to make some changes, but am I insane for just kind of sitting here thinking like, you just can't fucking do that? We know that this doesn't work. Why are we forcing this of these guys back together? Why do they have to continue to go out there as a pairing? Like, Find another way. I know if there's something we've learned, I think, from the Riley suspension is like almost less is more to an extent, right? Like where we don't need to be flashy. We're going to score our goals. You know, you have a high powered offense. You need to play consistency defensively and structure. And tonight there was no structure out there. Like it was a it was a rat race. It was chaos. And for me, the problem with the decor, I, I think, amounts to like trying to get involved in the rush every single play, right? Like mm-hmm. keep it simple. You have world class forwards, right? slow down the neutral zone, play a better game structure where I think it gets out, like it just gets ahead of them at times. And for me, this Riley Brody combo, like, I don't know how many times you have to keep going back to the well, like it's not working. Right. We've seen it. And I think with Riley out of the lineup and honestly, I think when Riley left the lineup, everybody was worried, you know, what is this going to be like? This is their best defenseman. They just simplify their game and they're better off for it. And I think everybody's better off for it. You look at tonight, I didn't like Samsonoff game at all. I, I I thought he was kind of all over the map tonight, but he also got screened a lot. There was a lot of just bad plays, bad hockey in front of him, where that's because guys are out of position. These two aren't playing well. It's chaos. And it also, I think, shows how weak this defense core is when they lose a guy and Labushkin's out on the lineup and they're trying to make – they just don't have depth. They don't have it where – it's almost like if they lost a better defenseman, it would help them just to simplify things. You talk about Benoit leaving the lineup. He was probably the best defenseman tonight by yeah. far. And he's hauling the puck. He's making simple plays. You don't need to make world-class plays all the time, right? It can be simple. You can play a great game on D and no one even noticed that you played. So for yeah. me, that's the struggle with this pairing. And I, I think they need to get rid of it and they need to simplify Because if you watch that game tonight, I'm sitting here. I've got other games on. You got, you know, you're kind of, I'm tracking everybody. There's no way I put the Leafs against anybody right now and think they're going to win. Like, you know, maybe a round. I, like, they're not Stanley Cup contenders whatsoever, especially playing the way they're playing. Yeah, the way that I kept looking at it this season, I was happy with the way uh, Tree Living approached the trade deadline as well, where it was like, we're not doing these big splashes. We're not trading prospects and first, second round picks just because I don't think the team had really earned it. I, I don't think that they had earned that right to go out and go crazy. And, the other thing that I got, I kind of laughed at the idea of it after was like, 
every year we get so horny as a Leafs fan base of like, let's go and get the big name. Well, take a look at the roster, guys. We've got the big names. Like, you've got Matthews, Nylander, Tavares, Riley. Like, yeah, it's nice. Vegas does that. And I mean, every now and then I get pretty jealous of what they're able to do. But at some point, you also kind of have to look at the guys in the room and say, hey, you're the ones who have to get this fucking done. Because if you're not going to be the best players on the ice, this team's not going to have a shot. This team's not going to be able to win. So I agree. I, I I just look at them on a nightly basis. I, I'm in the same boat as you. I don't think that this is a team that I'm going to be betting on to win series. If they do, I'm going to be happy about it. I think they've got the ability, but I don't go in confidently thinking that. Uh, now, I want to ask you about the goaltending. You touched on it a little bit there. I was insanely harsh on Ilya Samsonov to start the season. I think deservedly so. They send him down, get him away from the team. He comes back. Since he came back, I've given him uh, my, the flower, like as many flowers as I possibly could here because I think that this resurgence has been so vital to some of these wins that this Leafs team's had over the last stretch. Even that game against Carolina the other night, I, I think that if it's not for Samsonov, they're probably not even getting to OT just because of some of the opportunities the Canes had had there, how he had played in some of the situations and just maybe the moments. This game tonight, I don't think that this was his fault, but what did you make of his game here? What did you make of the decision to go back to him and not give Wall the start? And uh, how have you kind of broken down what he's done over the last like 17 games now, I guess it is, since he's returned? Yeah, so, you know, for me, I was very hard on him as well early in the season, rightfully so, right? It wasn't just because he was a Leaf. It was, it, you know, he was off, he was struggling, and it was hard to watch, right? Yeah. And, I, and I've been there before to an extent, but, you know, for him, he was just, you know, there was no chance for him to win games when he was playing before. And he came back, and it was a great reset, right, where he came back, and he's been rock solid. And I've loved his game a lot. He's been tighter and compact early in the year year he was super wide sliding he was he was kind of swimming all the time chasing plays and tonight I got a little bit of that drift in his game where I don't like it where even the first goal so for me I don't want to get super technical but it's a shot that goes through his arm because he reaches outside the post where if he just drops and shifts it's a routine save and then from there I think it just snowballs he made some timely saves but even the Sanheim one, I, I just find he's not even tracking the puck. He, I know there's engagement. He He's usually battling for a space tonight, looked off. So I didn't understand why he got this start tonight. I thought Wall would go. Wall was on the bench also. I don't know if he caught that. Martin Jones was on the bench. Yeah. I kind of scoured the internet trying to figure out if anything was up. I, this is, I would assume that everything's good. I would assume this is just getting Martin Jones a bone, getting him staying in it because they, they're going to need him, right? You never know what's going to happen. So... For me, I, I didn't love him getting the start. I know he played well against Philly before. I think you need to get Wall going as well. You know, he hasn't been great. I think that week against Boston, Wall, you know, lost two straight. I think the game at home definitely wasn't his fault. I thought the Leafs played horrible in front of him. But the game in Boston, you know, he wants one back or maybe two. It wasn't a great game. So for me, I think they're at a point where Wall's ceiling is a lot higher for me. Watching his game, yeah. the way he manages the game. And when he is off, he's not off bad. When Samson off is off off it's very ugly so for me tonight was just one of those ones maybe on the fourth one he gets a bit out of position it's a heck of a play um who makes the play a lot and on the spinorama right yeah. and he ends up getting out of the crease and swimming a bit but that's a crazy play all three guys back check for me it's just the simple things and tonight was not his night i just don't understand why you're going back to him it's like you're forcing that start so I don't necessarily love the decision i think at some point you need to go to wall you want to have wall going and for me I think he gives you a better chance to steal a series, but rightfully so Samsonov deserves his starts. Don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to undermine what he's done. He's been, I don't even know what it is in his last, what is he in his last 15? He's 12 and three, I guess 12 and four tonight or something. Yeah. It's, it's insane. His numbers and what he's done, the bounce back, I think between his ears and just the way he carries himself is very noticeable. Even when he was getting interviewed during that stretch, you could tell how mentally weak he was. And I think he's bounced back. But for me, it's at a point now where I just don't see why you're forcing this start tonight. And I think you got the result you kind of expected with it. Yeah, I I was surprised this morning. I was watching, I was doing a different show and then I hop over and watch the boys on the, the morning take and I hear them talking about Samsonov going like, I had just missed that. I hadn't seen it yet. So I was like, oh shit, okay, that's interesting. Like I was kind of surprised. <laughs> And then I did notice he was not, uh, Wall wasn't on the bench. Mike Johnson made the joke during the game, like they sent him to Washington already, said he's going to get a good night's sleep tonight. But 
I, I mean, just kind of big picture because I've seen people in the chat here as well talking about it like, oh, give give Jones a start. Maybe we got to go back Walt Jones. Like, how do you kind of handle these three guys being here? I think Samson off Wall is probably the guys you're going to end up going with. I do agree that you're going to need the third at some point, I, even if he's just going to sit on the bench in the playoffs. Like, whatever it is, it's important to have that guy around. But making sure these guys are ready for the playoffs, what – what do you do with a set of three goaltenders? Like Martin Jones wasn't bad by any means in making him come out of the uh, of the rotation and not playing in games, but what do you do now? Like how do you how do you handle the rest of the way with those three? You know, the best thing to have the Leafs have going for him is the fact that Mar Martin Jones is a veteran, has experience, yeah. and he's a good guy. He's not going to come in. He's not going to rock the boat. He's not going to... You know what the problem would be is if you had like a goalie like Samsonov, who's your third, who's a little more high maintenance you know, you're going to want to pamper you. You're trying to develop him. You're trying to do all these things where Martin Jones knows who he is. He's at the point where he is just, you know, a veteran guy that you can have in the locker room. So I think that's the best part about having him as your third, because he understands his role. He's going to come in, he's going to put his work and he's going to be a pro, be ready to go. Cause he still wants to keep playing next year or whatever goes on. Yeah. And he just showed how, how much value he has as a third. But I think the main thing is making sure both guys are going here, Samson off and wall. Right. So I think I think Wall has a better ceiling. Like for me, he is your prospect. He is your guy that has the ability to be a franchise changing goalie, right? He is very good already in limited games. And obviously, I think this injury set him back a bit. I've dealt with some ankle injuries. It's not the easiest thing to come back from. I thought he was good. It's going to take some time. But I think strategically speaking is you want to have both going. And then it's almost who gets hot at the right time, especially what years past have taught us is if you don't have two goalies going, God knows what happens, right? So even last year in Vegas, you look at like they go through their depth shot. They already had a lot of the depth, but they needed every single guy to come. Aiden Hill, who really wasn't even going to be on that roster, ends up turning into the guy where it could be Samsonov, it could be Wool, or it could be Martin Jones, which you know you're going to get. And Martin Jones has a lot of great playoff experience, which is super important, I think, for these younger guys to bounce ideas off of and just to be that sounding board. And for me, his experience, his rapport with the team – He's never going to undermine anyone, which is super important as a number three, which I've been that backup. At times, you're like a sports psychologist. You're sitting on the bench like, yeah. you know you're not playing, you know you're not doing shit, but you're just, guys are coming off, they're pissed off, and you could be one way or the other. I could help them get more mad and try to help myself out, or I could be a good teammate, and I think Martin Jones is the perfect fit for that. Uh, the chat seems to agree with you here as well. Very, very much on board with what you're saying about the goaltending so situation, rotation, kind of the level of importance of these guys. You mentioned when you first got on here, this is what I do. I get on I get on the post game and it's basically just straight emotion for like an hour, an hour and a half and battle with people in the chat, take phone calls, hear what people have to say. Was there anything here tonight that was sticking out to you? You're like, I got to talk about this from this game. This is This is something I need to bring up or I need to get off my chest. So I, I hate taking because I think he's played well and I think he's done a really good job, but I feel like the game's 3-2. They're back in the hockey game, and it's it's very fragile at this point, right? Now they have the – you can see the Leafs have the momentum, right? The second unit comes out, Nick Robertson makes a uh, some skilled play through the neutral zone. He's trying to force the puck in the zone. I think he gets tired, and the puck gets over a stick. They go down a score where I just see Nick Robertson on that power play. He's trying to do too much. He's trying to score. He's trying to take advantage of the fact that Mitch Marner's out of the game, and you can't do it all by yourself. And I think that's where the – for me, you know, being detached from the team and just an outsider now watching it, it's more of a, a selfish hockey to me. That's what the way it looked at that point where you got the team on the ropes right now. Like, they're hanging on. Like, we had a bunch of good chances. Earson was playing well. He made a really big save on Lilgren just before that in the slot. With He made a glove save on the power play, which was a, a key save. And then they go down and make it 4-2. Just a selfish play by me and something that I think the finds the kind of player he's trying to be. He's just trying to do too much right now where I see that and I see this team. And that's something I struggle with at times where when we start talking about the big teams and like, even the way like I, I was catching the Winnipeg Jets tonight, I, I watched them a lot. There's a lot more like selflessness involved in those teams winning the yeah. Boston Bruins. There's more depth where here it's like you're in the bottom six, just be a bottom six player for now. You're going to get your chance. You're going to score. You're going to do what you have to do. Where I find plays like that are defining in hockey games and define like a team. So that's something I struggle with because I was always a player that I had to be 
you know, a good teammate and all these other things because I was, you know, obviously I was a, I played in the NHL for a long time, but I was never a superstar. So I just accepted the role. Like if I'm not playing, I was like, okay, well, cause there was times when I played in the NHL and I backed up say Pekka Rene, it was either like we talked about Lilgren, Pekka was playing so good. I wasn't going to play or he was playing so bad. They had to play him to get him going. No, like no matter yeah. what I did, it was out of my control. So I see things like that. And that's like a red flag for me. So something I struggle with, I think as an ex player, you know, watching, fragile moments in the game where they have a chance to come back and possibly tie that game and win it in overtime. And you're just trying to do too much, trying to, you know, be the star. Yeah. The one way that I had heard it described, I think it was one of the best ones I've ever heard about this Leafs team. Uh, it was Jeff O'Neill. He said they kind of play score a goal, like let's score a goal and not we're playing hockey, which you see there's moments of that where it kind of shows and you're just like, fuck, you could have just made the simple play or made the smart decision where, no, it's not going to be pretty. It's not going to be on TSN tomorrow on the on the highlight reel or the turning point or whatever, but it's the play that's going to help you win the game. It's it's getting to the blue line and chipping the puck in and getting off the ice for a change or put, putting a little bit of a forecheck on rather than trying to beat three guys all, all on your own. Like It's that kind of stuff. You see that pop up every now and then with this team where it's just like, Guys, this is the stuff now where every single year it's going to hold you back when you get to the playoffs because you can do that in the regular season, but it's not something that's going to propel you to have success when it actually matters the most. And it can kind of just be frustrating to see that linger around the team. And I, I do agree with the Robertson stuff there uh, as well. Now, No, uh, I agree. It's just one of those ones for me, like to go off that point is it's it's it needs to be like the, the league is so talented right like there's so many skilled players but it needs to be like a blue line in thing where everything is structured and then once you get in the offensive zone wear them down or if you have a chance to have some skill have some skill but like work it there and and just grind teams down especially talk about a seven mm -hmm. game series like i don't see the leafs grinding a team down they're just trying to outscore you in a seven game series where like you talk about florida you talk about these heavy winnipeg you talk about the rangers some heavier teams that just they seem to just keep coming at you. So that's where I, I don't see that with this team. And come to a seven-game series, that's something I worry about. Now, the one thing here as well, the final thing before I, I let you go, I appreciate you taking the time to do this here. Uh, power so play has been a massive point of discussion. Uh, massive actually might even be an understatement for what's happened with this team over the last couple of weeks now. This is something that has pissed me off, and it's going to continue to piss me off. And the reason more so is not whether... The, the power play can score, they have the people on it or whatever. And I get tired of people talking about, is it the structure? Is it the guy who's running it? Like at some, at some point here, we kind of have to realize what's pissing me off and continues to is Mike Johnson highlighted it on the broadcast tonight about what happens in, in this, this stretch where they've not been good. They are forced to the perimeter. You're not getting chances inside. You're not getting in tight. You're not getting those high danger opportunities at such a frequent frequent rate that you were normally. That's what happens in the playoffs. The game gets tighter. It gets harder to do it, or harder to fight into the middle and get that much space and time and all that stuff to kind of execute the way that these guys do. And every year in the playoffs, we've seen this power play fall off. It, it's just not clicked at the same rate. And I think it's just because the game gets harder. I feel like we're just seeing that happen earlier now. And people are putting this panic on it and saying, it'll, it'll be fine. You've got the horses here. But this seems to be an issue that we've seen all for five years now of these guys going through these first rounds. What do you what do you do to fix this power play? Is it is it the structure? Is it just the mindset? Is it a lack of urgency? Like, why are they not clicking at the rate that we need them to right now? And I mean, they go one for three here tonight, so it's not like I'm gonna yell and scream about just this game as a one off, but kind of bigger picture. I think it's a simple simplifying it more than anything, right? Is is just being able to get to a point where you have all these, you know horses you have these guys that are just stallions that want to skate want to make plays high-end plays so trying to get it simple and get pucks to the net you look at Bertuzzi what he's been doing lately getting to the front of the net causing havoc and you're looking at a team that you know if you're going to play a perimeter game like Mike Johnson touched on and want the pretty stuff it's not going to come especially this time of year one thing I touch on a lot when I do shows and and just through my experience playing in the NHL is all of a sudden after trade deadline it's like things just tighten up it's a lot harder to get offense. It's a lot harder to get cookies. And as a goalie, it was great because you talk about perimeter. 
predictability is a word I use a lot. And I talked about, like, I played with Joel Edmondson, Joel Edmondson uh, Jake McCabe. I played with Ilya Labushkin. These are defensemen that just, like, sometimes aren't glitz and glamour. They're just going to play their position, right? And I think Jake McCabe has been extended a lot into that. So I think what the Leafs need to do on the power play is the same idea is be predictable in a sense of get pucks to the net and traffic, cause trouble. Even the Matthews one where tonight he just throws it. Mike Johnson actually talked about that. He throws it at the net just to create chaos, right? And for me, that was sometimes the worst thing is like, you'd be pinned in a position, or pucks are coming, there's a screen, you barely see it. And even frost goal tonight, where it's just pucks from the point, you can't see it. So for me, I think it's just, sim just simplifying things, not trying to be as fancy. And, you know, tonight, I, I don't know, like if you, I so I obviously you could know that I do starting goalies for Bet365 and yeah. I pick games each night. So I, I was flicking back and forth because I had the Jets tonight. I took the Jets and I took the team total over. And for me, I, I hit both bets, so I'm not trying to pump my own. <laughs> no pump. Right, them, so we hit them. both. We hit both, right? So I took the Jets money line against the Rangers, and I took the team total over. You know why? Because Shostak and his last games have been great, but I know the Jets are going to go in there and play a simple game. They're going to get pucks to the net. They're going to work hard. They're going to do the little things. Something that I want to see more from this Leafs team. So for me, I think sometimes we're so used to Austin Matthews, William Nylander, Mitch Marner. Sometimes they need to simplify it and just get pucks through. And that's something that's important, I think, for this team moving forward, especially as things tighten up in the second half post-trade deadline. Yeah, I was going to ask you as we were going to get you out of here, if you had bets or how your bets did tonight. I didn't follow the end of that one, but uh, very nice. Congratulations. I was, yeah, when I was both, looking at both. the over, over five and a half in that game this morning and like, I could get there, I could get there, and I just kept looking at Shesterkin, Hellebuck, Shesterkin, Hellebuck, and like, eh, I'm going to stay off. So stayed off, and unfortunately um, had Nick Robertson anytime goal that we gave out here for this show pregame. So tough way for that one to go down, but uh, is what it is. We'll bounce back and keep going. Uh, Carter, I appreciate you taking the time to do this. We see you on a bunch of different shows, doing a lot of different content. Where can people find you next? Yeah, I, I'm usually I'm going to be on Daily Faceoff tomorrow with uh, Tyler filling in, co-hosting. So that'll be fun. And uh, other than that, Bet Three Six Five, and when I uh, when I host here with Nick, so in the least morning take. So thanks for having me on, Zach. Obviously, great getting to meet you, and uh, anytime, man. Yeah, great to meet you as well. Appreciate you taking the time to do this, and uh, yeah, happy to have you back anytime. But. There he is, Carter Hutton, helping us out here on the Leafs Nation After Dark. We appreciate him taking the time to do this here tonight. Uh, and if you're not already, make sure to check him out on all the other stuff that he's doing. Daily Face Off tomorrow morning as well. So uh, thanks to Carter for doing this. If anybody else wants to call into the show here tonight, you guys are more than welcome. Send me a message on Twitter, Instagram. Send me a message in Discord if that's the best way for you to do that. But uh, you want to call in, you want to you wanna have your thoughts heard here, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button and uh, hit me up on whatever social platforms are easiest for you to do so. Chris Arsenal, Zach, the real money's on Brody scoring plus 350,000. Well, I mean, hey, you want to take the shot on it? If you, you think you got value there, then, uh, then go for it because that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to, we're trying to find bets we're trying to find opportunities to bring you guys uh some plus money some longer shots that's what i'm looking for you know we can give out these shots on goal and and minus 110s minus 120s and stuff and i get that and it's fun to do but it's a little bit more fun if we can hit some plus 425 plus 475 plus 500s all that kind of stuff those are fun to do unfortunately we don't win one here today we lose the nick robertson Anytime goal score bet uh, that we had looked at. And you know what? The main reason that I was looking at Nick Robertson to score here tonight was just because of how I was breaking it down of where he fits in this lineup. And we've talked constantly about... We've talked constantly, constantly about the fact that uh, Nick Robertson is a top six guy and not a bottom six guy, right? He's a guy who's going to play with a high-level talent, high-end talent, and is going to have to fit in there with them. He's a guy who's going to have to be in a an environment where he's going to be around other high-end players, and he was just never going to get that when he's been in, you know, behind Tyler Bertuzzi when he was behind Michael Bunting before like those were guys he was just never going to push past I still don't think he's in the opportunity opera he's got an opportunity to do that so with John Tavares there 
on that third line, I think it opens things up for him. I think it gives him more of a chance. But that being said, as Carter said, you know, you're going to have to, you're still going to have to at that point do the right things, play the game the right way. And if you're going to play the game the right way, the best place to do that would be at Bet99 Bet Sportsbook. That's where we're placing these bets. That's where we're giving these out from. Look, incredible sports book, local Canadian sports book as well. Uh, top tier customer service, fast payouts, and smooth transactions. Bet 99 should be your choice of sports book. Remember, you must be 19 plus. Please play responsibly. It is available to persons in Ontario, but that's where uh, that's where we're giving these bets out at. That's where you can follow along. And you know what? As much as we appreciate Bet 99 for being a part of the show and sponsoring the show. We're going to look to try to take some money from them. I mean, come on. We're, that's the whole point of this, right? We're trying to win bets. and We're trying to put money in our pockets, taking it out of theirs. You know, we, we, we love them. We love the support they've shown. So we should be signing up at their book. We should be heading over there right now to bet99.ca to sign up. That being said, we're going to try to take some money. We're, we're trying to win some money from Bet99, so we appreciate the support. Make sure to head on over there as well and uh, sign up now. But, uh, yeah, we lose that bet tonight, Nick Roberts, any anytime goal scorer. And we did, did see him on the second power play unit. That was another reason that I was in there it, looking at that as well. So um, tough one, tough one for us tonight. I thought we were going to get it. We don't. That's unfortunate. If you guys are watching right now and you haven't already, please hit that like button. Subscribe here to the channel. Turn on notifications to get notified every time we go live. I'm seeing we're five likes away here from more smelling salts. Look, I've got multiple bottles of smelling salts here. I've got different types. It, these things are, the names on this are just fucking insane. Raging Bull. Bottled Insanity. Doom Cylinder. I can't even read this one. I, I Horse? Like, this is what you guys do to me. Hit the like button and let's get 50. Let's get 100, 200, whatever. Let's get it done. As well, people want to call in. You guys can call in. Uh, I see there's someone waiting uh, who wanted to call into the show here as well. So we'll get them in and uh, hear their thoughts on tonight's game uh, from all the way from a different, different country, different continent, different time zone. I mean, I, I want to continue to talk about tonight's game, see where we're at, see where you guys are at in the chat. I will continue to answer stuff. I see a super chat here as well. I'm Max, I apologize. I wasn't ignoring it, but yeah, we'll get to that here. Our friend Max Antius Decimus, Decimus with the super chat. Max, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Max says, Riley Brody, that's all. That's a super chat. Max, seriously, seriously, it's tough, that was tough, um, yeah, I don't want to see those guys together, I, I, I don't understand, it's just, you know, sometimes you could look at it and be like, okay, it's a lull, it's, it's a down period, whatever, this, this has not, Felt like that with these guys. They have not been good this year. They've not been able to get it done. Uh, they've been struggling every time they've gone out there. I, why go back? Why go back and try it? I, I don't get that. It's, you know, the definition of an insanity. We talk about it over and over again. Why they bring these guys back? Why they bring these guys back? Run it back, run it back, run it back. Well, okay, you're going to run it back. That's fine. Maybe let's fucking mix up the D pairings here and not go with a pairing that we've known has not been good all season. That's, it's tough to see. Uh, but what is also going to be tough to see for myself I, as well, I guess, is my face after I do these smelling salts. So 50 likes. I appreciate you guys all. Let's, uh, let's get to that. Oh man. I don't think I did this one yet on stream. This is a new bottle. <coughs> oh, That one was intense. Oh, my God. All right. Well, we're going to welcome in a caller. You can probably hear him there in the background. We're going to welcome in a caller to the show. Let's hit the animation. Okay. Are you ready? Let's go. Don't go change it. Do it your way. Go 
go down blazing. Don't go change it. Do, do, do it your way. Go down blazing. Sugar and spice. Everything nice. Have a little class and do it right. I gotta say the way I feel. That's right. Buttercup. This is serious stuff. I love the people. Ready? Go. I don't get enough time in this show. I love the people. How's it going? Good to see you. Good to see you. Good to see you. How you doing? Lovely to look at and delightful to see. Love that. A wise guy. You look good, really. You look, you look good. Don't go change it. Do it your way. Go down blazing. Don't go change it. Do it your way. Go down blazing. Doing that one for the old grapes. Go down blazing. All right, there you go. Welcome to Leafs Nation After Dark. All the way from Japan, Ohio, goes, I'm, uh, I'm going to screw that part up there, Gord. Ohio <laughs> goes, you got to say the last part for me so that I can repeat it back. Okay. Ohio goes, I Ohio goes, I must. Ohio goes, I must, Gord. Welcome Ohio's to I'm Leaf I'm Station back. After Dark. How's it going? Oh my God, my eyes it's watering good. from that smelling salts. <laughs> better you than me guy better yeah. you than me <laughs> yeah gord how are you feeling after this game tonight uh well you know mixed feelings probably like everybody in the chat i, th- I thought uh uh carter hutton broke down the game quite well so not a lot left to say after that but excellent breakdown um yeah i mean uh kind of a scattered hockey game a little bit you know a little bit similar to the Carolina game the other day I thought a little bit scattered at times it looked good at times looked good at moments but looked scattered disorganized at other times uh definitely you know uh Marner's absence and uh Yarncroc out of the lineup and you know putting the blender in all the lines and stuff is gonna have something to do with that right yeah um so, but, you know, like you and like everybody else in the chat, you know, I'm concerned with these last, I don't know, 18, 17 games, what it is, and tightening up the, tightening up the team and getting ready for playoff hockey. And I'm seeing far, far too many of the same issues that are over and over again, happening over and over again that, uh, you know, result in, uh, result in either scoring chances or goals against. And they just happen all the time. And I don't know. Everybody on the chat in the chat is on Brody, so I, I don't know. Let's maybe avoid Brody because I don't know what else to say about that. I really don't know what else to say about that. Guy has a por- horrible gap. Other than, uh, I think I mentioned this last time, but I was watching Kip- I was watching Kipper and Bourne, and they brought up a stat. Uh, Bourne brought up a stat that. Last year, Brody was uh, in the top 20, not percent, the top 20 players in retrievals that resulted in breakouts in the NHL. Right. Retrievals that, so going back, getting the puck, turn it around, transitioning the other way, and getting your team going the other way. This year, he's in the bottom 20, not percent, players, <laughs> players. defensemen in the NHL. Right. So he's got zero goals in like forever. He's got, what, 17 assists or something. So I don't understand how we can't afford to have Brody out of the lineup because Benoit doesn't transition the puck as well. Like, what are we sacrificing? We're sacrificing, what, Brody's 17 points in 65 games? He's, he's struggling to transition the puck. Clearly, he's at the bottom of the league in it. So he doesn't box out net front. He loses 50-50 board battles. Time in, time out. Yep. That second goal, I think it was the second goal or the goal where, uh, yeah, the Leafs are up three to two. And then he just, with fresh ice, second period, uh, third period, just throws the puck blindly. Like Riley is just too far away to make that play, to get that play. And Brody had a good look at where Riley was and where the defending uh, oncoming four checker was. And he just, he just decided to throw it back there. A lot of really bad decisions, but. Anyway, that's all I'm going to say about Brody because I'm just going to drive myself nuts if I talk about that any longer. 
Uh, um, all right, well, let's get let's be positive okay. then, Gord. Let's talk about Simone Benoit. Okay. He makes his return to the lineup tonight. I agree with Carter, and he was talking about Benoit. He was potentially the best defenseman on the ice uh, for the Leafs here tonight. I think he came out fiery. I think he had a lot of energy. I think he was probably pretty pissed off that he was sitting in the press box. I, I think he had had some good answers and, and some good quotes to the media too where he's like, no, I'm obviously not happy with it. I'm not okay with it, but I know that it's part of the job. You know, you're gonna take your opportunity when it comes. You're gonna you're gonna get the tap at some point. You got to take take advantage of it uh, the best way possible, or as much as you can. Let's get let, let's get positive here. I think he played a good game uh, tonight. He gets back into the lineup. What did you make of uh, of Benoit and what you do with him going forward? Should never have come out of the lineup in the first place. Should never have. He's, he, they brought up a stat tonight. I don't know what expected goals are. I mean, you're going to have to go to Jonas on TSN for that stat. I have no idea. But they brought up that stat. And, and of the Leafs defensemen, uh, Brody is last and Benoit is first. Yeah. He's first in the defense core for expected goals. And I guess that means when you're on, when you're, when you're on the ice, your team is has a better chance of scoring than the other team does. I'm thinking. I don't know how they break that stat down. Probably you know. You're a young generation guy. I have no idea. But I know what the eye test is. And the eye test is he boxes out net front. He wins 50-50 battles. He has a way better gap than Brody. He's not a timid guy. Brody just backs up, backs up, backs up, gives the opposing team the blue line every single time. Every single time, but not not Benoit. Benoit's got that reach, and he'll stay up there. He'll make that play. He likes to go up and make that hit at the blue line. Mm. He did you see that one play where where uh, there was a there was a cough up at our blue line, and um, who's that speedster on uh, Philly? Tippett. Who's that speed? Yeah, Tippett. So Tippett gets by. Tippett, the fastest guy in the league with the puck this year. Uh, he gets by, but and but Benoit's on pretty much even with them. But he takes the right angle, comes up, seals the play away. Beautiful! What a beautiful play that was. Very simple thing. Just co- goes in there, cuts them off. Perfect, perfect play. How, yeah. Benoit played great. You know, okay, so so maybe his transitions aren't as smooth. Maybe he's not as good with the puck. I'll sacrifice that for what Brody doesn't do. I'll sacrifice that. We're not gonna. Like like I said, here any stat that you're bringing up, all these you know uh, these expected goal stats. Brody's at the bottom. He's at the he's been the bottom twenty defenseman in the entire NHL for transitions on retrievals. What exactly are we giving up in this guy? And what mm-hmm. he's got a five million dollar contract, so you can't put the guy in the suit. Look, they, uh, Philadelphia has no problem putting their captain in a suit <laughs> yeah, and yeah. calling. Him that. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. it, there's got to be a, a little bit more. I don't know what it is. They feel that if we don't get Brody going, we're not going to have that transition game that is really our hallmark. And uh, so, therefore, we're not going to be able to do anything. Look, they're not going to be able to go anywhere in the playoffs if Brody can't box out net front. If Bro- I don't care how many transition plays he'd make. There's going to be three or four times a game where somebody's going to have a free shot at the net, he's going to have an, en- an entry, he's going to let in a, a let in a play, he's going to cough up a puck. Oh my goodness, it's just tough to watch again and again and again. But yeah, yeah. Benoit should never have come out of the lineup in the first place, in my opinion. Yeah, should never okay. come out of the lineup in the first place. So Gord, expected goals. It yeah. was at expected goals against stat. Uh, by the way, is what the one that they showed, which is basically just an accumulation of how the <laughs> okay, I'm trying to think how to explain this basically the expected goals against is they're like that chance by the flyers this specific chance is worth this much of a goal or expected goal uh, and then you accumulate those and that can determine your expected goals for and your expected goals against that can give you your number of your expected goal share and the per 60 is effectively just saying as it was pointed out in the chat there as well the expected goals against per 60, per 60 is effectively saying if Simone Benoit was on the ice for or of the, over 60 minutes, if he was on the ice for 60 minutes straight, this is how many goals would be expected 
to be scored against him while he's on the ice. That's what that metric means. So that is just extrapolating it over 60 minutes rather than just looking at it as like shift by shift by shift to kind of give you that bigger picture number. And that's where he had the best expected goals against on this team. So, and I saw, I see someone in the chat. I see Mark there talking about like, oh, these, these stats are too much and stuff. I think it gets too much one way or the other. I think it's too much to completely pretend that they don't exist or that they're not important. And I think that it's also on the other end to way too much with some of these guys who do it to think that it's just gospel. You know, every single year we look at at the trade deadline, oh, here's this player card, Ilya Labushkin. He's the worst fucking defenseman to ever play in the NHL. And it's like he gets to Toronto and his player card all of a sudden means nothing because it's completely flipped the other way. Simone Benoit, worst signing ever is true living a moron. Player card stinks like shit. Well, now all of a sudden he's got the best expected goals against per 60 on this Leafs team. Like you have to take these things with a grain of salt because you have to match some of the stuff with A, what you see because guess who... You know what? You're the wrong person to say this to, but guess who was yeah. lo- beloved by some people in the analytics community? It was Justin Hall. And then we would continue to watch him go out there and the Detroit Red Wings are putting him in the press box right now and they paid him three and a half million dollars for three years, right? Like some of this stuff, we it just, you have to kind of watch and actually put these pieces together where it's like, okay, this is what we're seeing, but this is what this is telling us. So sometimes those are just important pieces. I just want to get that out there. That's my thoughts on it. Uh, I I was frustrated uh, the other day when I saw that Bertuzzi was taken off the power play. That was in on Saturday night. I understand that they were trying to change things up. I understand that the power play has sucked for the last little while, but... I just could not wrap my head around that. Uh, I'm watching this. It feels like I'm playing minor hockey again, and you've got two defensemen. You've got two defensemen out there on your power play unit. You've got those guys going together. You, you've got Lilligren and Riley because Keefe is absolutely forcing the hell out of it and being like, well, we got to get Lilligren going. We got to get Lilligren going. Like, okay, this is what you're, you've decided is the way to fix this one. But then you take Bertuzzi off, and now you go to Varis. Matthews and Nylander. I mean, we're talking about this graphic that comes up on the screen. I talked about it with Carter. I'm going to talk about it here with you. It pissed me off. I will talk about it myself before. I'm going to talk about it after. They're talking, though, the reference keeps being made about how it's, they're playing on the peripheral, and that's why they're not able to score. They're not generating chances. They can't get to the middle of the net. Gord, who's the one fucking guy on this team who's doing this better than anybody, at at least in my opinion? It's Tyler Bertuzzi. That's the guy who goes to the front of the net. That's the guy who gets into these soft spots. That's the guy who wins net front battles and tips pucks and is in front of the net screening. That's the guy who scores the goal here tonight from the pass from Morgan Riley because he gets into the soft spot in the middle of the ice where, guess what? It's the hardest to fucking score in the playoffs because everything tightens up. And yet in some in some insane way, there was a justification made to Sheldon in Sheldon Keefe's mind that he this is the guy that's coming off the power play. I could not understand that. We see him out there late in late game situation, but like I still just don't understand why this guy's not being used that way. Like, are, are you in the same are you on the same page as me here with the usage of Bertuzzi, how he should be used? Uh, absolutely. And we talked at the, uh, about this ad nauseum about the Leafs power play being too peripheral, being too peripheral. And finally, they decide to make an adjustment. I think it was when when uh, uh, Tavares got hurt for a couple of games there. He was out for a couple and they put Bertuzzi in and it worked beautifully. And they seemed to get away from that idea of just moving it around, moving it around, and uh, just getting it at the net, just getting at the net. And that's what they got to do. They got to simplify things. I think Carter touched on that when he were, you were talking. He goes, when playoffs come around, you got to simplify the game. And that was one the point I was trying to make to, you about, make to you about the big guys not showing up, which I fully am on board and agree w- with you on that. But yeah. I was the point I was trying to make about that is they got to simplify their game to a more playoff style game, which is a more north south game. But what happens is they get into that flow game and they want to put it around and around and around. And then the, the opposing team just all they do is you can see it slowly. That box just slowly keeps spreading out and it keeps it just chokes and chokes and chokes the periphery out. 
until they 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 just run out of passing options because they choke themselves off of making any plays. Rather than just simplify, get it at the net, hack and whack. If the other team wins a 50-50 battle and gets the puck down the other end, so what? So be yeah. it. Go down, pick it up again, and go down again and get it and get it to the net again. Get it to the net again. But you need that greasy guy like Bertuzzi in front of that rather than Tavares, who's good in tight and down low, 100% understand that. But the thing with Bertuzzi, and I've mentioned this several times, is he stands in front of the goalie's eyes, where Tavares tends to stand off to the side of the goalie, looking for tips at the side of the goalie, rather than getting right in front, right in the goalie's grill. And, right. and you got shooters, like, you got shooters like Matthews and Nylander on either side. You need to get that guy in front of his grill, where the guy can't see the puck. And I yep. wholeheartedly agree that he's got to get back on. He's got to get back on there. Uh, so yeah, you, you're preaching to the choir on that on that one there. And and right from the get go, you were you, through all the 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 slump and struggles that Bertuzzi was going through. You like held fast. Look, this guy's going to be uh, this guy's going to be a beneficial in the playoffs because he plays that type of game. And I was fully on board with that. I wasn't a, I wasn't a, I, I I might have said I criticized him sometimes. Like I criticized his skills. Like he can't shoot the puck. Okay, he can't. He can shoot the puck. He's an NHL hockey player, a NHL caliber player. He can't shoot the puck. I mean, he's probably got a worse shot than Marner, and Marner shoots the puck like the twelve-year-olds I coach in terms of his in terms of his velocity. Okay, in terms of his uh, placement, and that's a whole other thing. But in terms of velocity, so he so Bertuzzi can't shoot the puck, can't can't stick handle the puck, but he he knows where to go he's got great hockey IQ. Yeah. he knows when to dump the corner to to keep a cycle going he knows when to chip it into the middle where, where it's not going to get turned over the other way he knows when to go to the net he's and he's got a he's got that uh he's got that go 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 all the time so he's definitely uh, a playoff type hockey player which i was fully on board with it's good to see him you get vindicated on supporting him and him him coming him coming through uh, like he should. And I 100% fully agree that he should be on PP1. Mm -hmm. No question whatsoever. The other issue with PP1, as we all know, is Morgan is way too stiff. He telegraphs passes. He takes too long. He's not fluid. Our other option is Lilligren, which doesn't help. It might yeah. even be a good... They tried this before. A good idea to put Miner, uh, Marner back on the point and have him, have him uh, you know, dishing from there. You know he can skate backwards if there's turnovers. He can he can get back or whatever. I, I I might even I might even go back and try that again. But Riley is unfortunately I like Riley, but he's far too stiff on the power play. He just yeah. telegraphs his passes. If he's going to make a pass to one side or another, he literally turns his entire body over to that where he's going to pass it. Then he makes the pass. So everybody, especially the goalie, is going to read that. The goalie is going to read off of that. I liked what Carter said about uh, about Labushkin, uh, McCabe, Benoit, those types of guys. Where regular season, maybe those types of guys you look at and you look at them. Oh, they're, they're number five or six guys. But in the playoffs, when the game gets simplified and a lot of a lot of hockey is one net front or down low, those guys are are definite assets on your hockey team. And as a goalie, from a goalie's perspective, it's good to hear that because I definitely agree with what he said, and I've been saying that all along. Yeah. So good for him for bringing that up. I like He had a great analysis of tonight's game, so he, he really wrote that down. Yeah. Well, okay, I would say too thing. as well, Gord, with sure. it is like when you're talking about these guys and you're talking about regular season, I feel like we've gotten into this mode here in Toronto for a long time that had been this uh, flowy, fluent players, you know, it's, it's Mikheyev and Kerfoot and, um, um, uh, Angvol, sorry, that's who it was. I was trying to think of, uh, they, these guys who play in your bottom six and, and there's fast and they're long and, you know, or they just get up and down the ice and they play this like more skilled game. And then it's like every year you get to the play, <laughs> you get to the playoffs, excuse me. Y you know what happens when you're looking out at there at these guys, 
you're you're basically they're the first people that get turned on and hated by this franchise by the fan base when you get to the playoffs because they're missing what's kind of needed in that bottom middle six area of like that grit that that heart the winning battles getting to the front getting the other stuff done and then you bring in these other guys Edmondson Labushkin Benoit um Let's throw Bertuzzi in that mix just because of at least I'm thinking kind of the style if we're going to bucket some of these guys. You know what? Are they pretty? No. Are, are they guys who are going to put a, put themselves on the highlight reel for 82 games in the regular season? No. It, are they guys who are going to put themselves on the highlight reel in the playoffs? I'm going to say more than likely, no. But you know what they're going to do? They're going to be effective. And the thing with some of those guys who played in the bottom six before, these guys who are these fast and analytical darlings that you know the spreadsheet boys fall in love with, is that it's not that they're they're like these negative players to your team come the playoffs. They're just not effective. They're basically just zeros. There's zeros across the board. There, there's no impact on the game that goes from the first time they step on the ice to the end, and, and it doesn't roll over through seven games because the way I'm going to play Alex Kerfoot in game one is not going to change from game one to two to five to seven because he's not wearing the opponents down. He's not tiring guys out. He's not pissing people off. He's not getting in there and hitting guys. Like the, None of that stuff is happening from him. Yeah, he's going to play hard, and I don't have a, any problem with Kerfoot at all or him as a person. Nothing. Like I got no issue with that. But the, problem, but the difference is that you know what's going to happen every single time whether you win the series or not, but the Leafs go up against the Bruins, is that Tyler Bertuzzi is going to go to the front of the net and slash somebody in the back of the knee. And that guy from game one to game two is going to go from the rink to home, ice his knee all night, have eight Tylenols because he needs the swelling to go down, show up to the rink on for game two, and his knee is going to be ballooned out and he's going to be fighting through it. You know, and it's like, hey, we can talk about whether or not this stuff is clean or whatever, but that's how the fucking playoffs work. So I'm sick and tired of hearing these people in Toronto. that's how the Bruins play. Right. That's how the Bruins play. That's That's how how Tampa plays. plays. Florida plays. Colorado is going to play that way. Vegas plays that way. Dallas plays that way. Like, every team that we look at and say, that's a contender, that's a contender, that's a contender, they play that fucking way. Yeah, they've got these skilled guys in their lineups. They've got these guys who can go up and down the ice and through the legs and make nasty plays and end up on the highlight reels tomorrow morning. But the guys who are going to make a legitimate impact that get constantly tossed to the side is the guy who cross checks you in the spine in front of the net and gets away with it because that's who he is and he's a big veteran player and he's gone on stanley cup runs with st louis and montreal and you paid a minimal price to get him here to be a part of your team and be a part of that so these are the guys that i look at i'm like those guys are going to be impactful and they're not going to jump off paper, but they're just going to be guys that you look back at in through different games, through series, and say, like, that guy was important. Uh, we do have a super chat here, Gord, so I want to get to that. I do appreciate this as well. Um, first time super chat here on this stream. So thank you very much, but let's hit the animation quick. Uh, Travis Freeman. Thank you for the super chat here. Travis says, does Cade Weber make the team this year or join the Marlies? Uh, Cade, I would say, or uh, Travis, I would say about Cade is all, basically 100% chance he is not. Um, or 100% he is not on this Leafs team come the uh, end of the season, end of his season, I guess. He did win the best defensive defenseman in Hockey East he is what six foot seven monster monster demon. He says he plans to sign with Toronto. I think realistically, we got to kind of temper some of the expectations on these guys. It's probably more likely than not that he is not a regular in the NHL. <coughs> excuse me, NHL ever. It it's just what it is. He was a late round draft pick. Uh, it's not like this guy's been some highly touted player. He's obviously pretty good. He won the best defensive defenseman there in NCAA hockey, which is continuing to get better and better and better every single year. Realistically, he's probably, he's probably not an everyday NHLer, but the thing is that he's a monstrous defenseman who plays a defensive style, probably pretty physical. I can't speak too much to it. I don't know too much about him. You went out there and you got him for pretty much nothing. He wants to sign with your team. He wasn't going to sign with Carolina. He made that clear. And Tree Living said, fuck it, we'll take him. And 
for those people who are going to have these doubts and be like, why are these guys wasting picks on this? They basically traded the pick that like Carolina would have drafted him in the equivalent. You know what I mean? Like uh, Carolina drafts him late. We just sent a late draft round pick for a guy. Perfect. Fine with that. And oh, by the way, if you're going to doubt the Leafs scouting and their ability to find some of these guys, why don't we just all take a look at that guy named Easton Cowan playing for the London Knights right now, who went on a 34-game point streak, is absolutely lighting it up, has six shorthanded goals, was on the power play, played on Team Canada at the World Juniors, and everyone was laughing, including myself, to be honest with you, uh, about the fact that Easton Cowan was a guy who was projected to go like mid, mid-second round, and the Leafs grabbed him in the first round. I'm just going to shut my mouth at some of these prospects because realistically, you got no fucking clue. Like, we do, we just don't know. You don't know with some of these guys. So it is what it is. I think that's kind of the kind of breakdown that I could give you uh, there, Travis. I appreciate the super chat, but I think that's kind of the best answer I could give. Uh, as for what he'll do at the end of the season, I mean... I don't know what state the Marlies are really in in terms of in, in what they're looking for to add to their team. I would assume he's probably just going to sign and join the Marlies. Like that's, but I, I'd pretty much put it at 0% he's on the Leafs. Uh, Gord, you had something else for me here. Uh, what was it? You said there was another thing that was bugging you tonight or that what you wanted to talk about. Yeah, just, just to add to what you said, yeah, why not take a flyer on a guy? That size, that size, the guy wins the NCAA top defense. So, hey, yeah. that's worth taking a flyer and, and wasting a low-end low, uh, low end pick. I mean, especially the Leafs' biggest lack is their, you know, Maybe stout Gord defenseman. Um, Gord, you might be uh, muted. There you go. Yeah. You okay? Can you hear me? Yeah, we're good now. Okay. Yeah, so just to add to what you said, like, uh, yeah, why not take a flyer on a guy that size, wins the best defenseman in the NCAA? I mean, obviously, the guy's got some skill to go along with that size. But, yeah, I agree with you. Like, he's not going to get anywhere a sniff near the NHL this year. I don't even know about the Marlies, but they're probably set. But maybe he will. But why not take a flyer on uh, on this guy? Sure. At yeah. least <laughs> – I'm hoping within the next little while, like tree living is going to be, fo- and it's, and his uh, scouting department is going to be focusing on D because they got some good young forwards. Uh, Minton's a good young forward. Easton's a good young forward. I don't know what they're going to do with Robertson. I'd like to see, why not give Robertson a bump up to the top line instead of Holmberg? I mean, like you're saying, he's not, if the guy's projected as a top, he's not a grinder. He's a scorer. He's a shooter. So if you're going to, if you're, if you're mi- you're mix smashing lines or whatever, Holmberg's not a first line guy. Yeah, it's, it, he might be a first line guy if Mitch Marner's out there and he's the guy who's going in there forechecking and digging pucks out. But if you got Bertuzzi doing that job, you, what's Holmberg doing? You know what I'm saying? He's not he's not making he's not making tic tac toe plays with with uh, Matthews. Well, and we saw them I'm, change that here tonight, right? Like he made Keith did make yeah. the adjustment. Yeah, I, he put Domi in there, and then he was they were buzzing together. Yeah, and I thought about that yeah. before too. I thought. Wouldn't Domi be a, an interesting, you know, winger on that up uh, up on the top line as well? But yeah. not Holmberg. I mean, Holmberg and Bertuzzi. Holmberg, fine. Like I said, if you've got if you got Marner there and he's doing the grunt work, sure, no problem. Uh, but give give give. Why not give Robertson a shot? I don't know. I think Keith's got it in for Robertson or something. I don't know. He yeah. seems to produce with what little time that he has. Obviously, his. Lack of size, his lack of ability to, he's a lack of ability to, you know, sustain forecheck and play that heavy down low hockey. But his ability, his ability to get the puck off quickly in tight spots on the net is uh, pretty impressive. And I can imagine he and uh, Matthews could, you know, put something together give it a shot i just don't i don't know that that's a head shaker for me the only thing for uh, me with robertson that i would jump in on gorda is like i don't feel like robertson is a play driver i don't i don't feel like he's a guy who's like creating opportunities for himself some of these kind of just have to come to him i don't disagree with your what you're saying about like i actually i actually not just don't disagree i actually would agree with the assessment of like he's good in those situations you're bringing up and being able to get the puck in tight in some of those spots he's got a good shot he's capable of scoring i just don't look at him right now as like oh that's a guy who can go out there and get stuff done for himself and if he's not going to be doing that i can kind of see where he's going to fall 
or how he's going to be falling in the eyes of like a guy like Keith, but maybe not as far as you know i i am kind of on on board with like hey maybe this is like too far and you know we i saw a funny tweet tonight it was like the gordon ramsay meme where he's you, you've ever seen the video of him when he's talking to the little kid in the top chef competition with the kids and he's like oh it's okay sweetheart or like whatever and then there's the ones of him when he's doing the shows with the adults and he's screaming like you're a fucking moron uh, it was a it was the two pictures okay. side by side and the first one said Sheldon Keefe, when TJ Brody makes a mistake and it was him hugging the kid and kissing it on the head or whatever. And then the other one was Sheldon Keefe when William Nylander and Nick Robertson make a mistake. I thought it was pretty funny, but it's just like there's the two ends of the spectrum. You know, we had at the beginning of the year that whole camp scandal where he's up in the press box and we're all sitting here going, why the fuck is he the guy? Like there, like that was when Mitch Marner was playing terrible. And I'm not saying put Mitch Marner in the press box, but it's like, Mitch is not missing shifts. Mitch is playing 30 minutes a night still here. And he was playing terrible. And it's like, what are we doing? Why, why is this the message being sent? Some of it, I just don't quite understand. I do agree. And we do have a super chat here as well. And it, it's going along with what we're talking Travis, about. Travis, coming back strong. That a boy, Travis. Thank you to Travis for the super chat. Travis says uh, a couple things here, so we'll get to both of them, but two super chats from Travis. Uh, Step in the right direction from Tree to try and bring in more defensive guys. (laughs) Then the silly puck movers like Robertson guys got no, uh, guys got no defense. Great shot, but can't create much. So Travis, thank you very much for the super chats there. We do appreciate that. Uh, But yeah, Gord, I mean, this kind of all encompassing of what we're talking about with Weber, what we're talking about with uh, Edmondson and, you know, Benoit and McCabe obviously being here already, but I imagine they're probably going to try to get something done with him. It's not just them. It's Labushkin comes in and it's just, these guys are defensive first, almost defensive only with some of them. It feels like we're heading in the right direction, but yeah. I didn't like Edmondson on that first goal. If you look at that first goal, he did the old lay on the shot block. He he goes out. He's halfway between the goalie and the shooter, and the guy the guy shoots and he turns his body like the, it's almost like the flamingo, but it's not the flamingo. It's the old lay. He turns his body sideways, and that body. If he had it just squared up, stayed squared up, he would have taken that shot block. I didn't like that at all. I didn't, I I didn't take it the same way. I had a different interpretation. I thought he was trying to get, get himself bigger and get down into the lane like that, dropping to the one knee going sideways rather than, I think where he was coming out like that, I think he was just going shin pads and then tried to get bigger. He turned, he, he turned and the puck went by him right where he turned. He was anyway, I I didn't like the look of that. Let's put it that way. That was, that was a tough look. And I I don't mind how he's been playing. He's been playing pretty stout as well. So that's fine. Right. Uh, Another thing I wanted to bring up, I like the way Nylander's been playing lately. I like the way he played in uh, Carolina. I've been liking the way, like I've been like, as you know, I've been a big Nylander detractor for a long time. Yeah. Uh, But there was one thing I saw today that, uh, and it's not Nylander, but it's, and I brought this up many, many times is cheating for offense, cheating for offense. And I think Mike Johnson, he, he uh, isolated in the first period where Nylander is on the other side of the puck on the other side of the puck, the the defender, or I I don't know if it's a defender or F3 came up and took the puck off the boards high and Nylander was out again, past the blue line looking for to get that breakaway pass. And that guy walked right in downtown, got a shot on that. Luckily, there was a save on it. But but uh, Mike Johnson highlighted that. And I, I'm like, yeah, I saw that. I saw that yeah. too. You know, And it's like, there's, w- there's still way, way too much of that as a team. And that's, those, those, that's the kind of thing when you're talking about playoff hockey that you've got to get rid of. You've got to get rid of that. It's got to be defensive-minded first north south hockey and then you from the, your turnovers you create offensive opportunities but you got to have that defensive minded first and and there's still too much of that seeping into their game 
And I know I come on here and people like complain because I say negative things and negative things. Like there's positive things too. But, you know, here we are breaking down the game and the team lost. Well, what are some of the things that, uh, you know, uh, affected the outcome of the game? And you know, we're yeah. talking about those. You know? So yep. it's not, I don't want to, I don't want to be all negative all the time, but you know, when I'm watching the game, I'm making mental notes of these, you know, it's just like, yeah, you know, that's something that, and that's something that's significant because it's recurring. It's recurring a lot and other teams are getting played. The guy who had to walk down Broadway and had a, had a, you know, uh, scoring chance, a shot on net. And to me, that's what expected goals mean, scoring chances, you know, more scoring yeah. chances, right? So if you're on yeah. the ice and the team's getting more scoring chances against, and it's those types of plays that result in scoring chances. But yep. yeah, so, so anyway, that's about, that's about all I had to say for today. Uh, and I'm, before I ramble on too much, I think maybe I'll let you go. <laughs> all right, Gord. No, I appreciate it. You're I, always welcome. Any, found, anyone's I, welcome. I found that usually, sorry. I find that usually when I come on here, I, I have like a, a, you know, a best before date and Usually it's around 20 minutes. After that, I start rambling incoherently. So, <laughs> <laughs> No, no, I appreciate it. I, I The chat appreciate it as well, uh, getting to hear from you and hear your thoughts on the game, giving some different inputs, some different perspectives. I think we had a cool show here tonight. I think it was like 20 minutes, 15 minutes. I did solo. Then Carter came on, Carter Hutton, obviously. Uh, make sure to check out the rest of his stuff and tomorrow morning on Daily Faceoff. But get to have him in, get a little bit of a goaltender's perspective, talk about Samsonov, Wall situation, you know, Martin Jones, what did they do with him? Uh, I, I, I don't know. I think this is pretty good. We get a call from Japan here from Gord. So I couldn't yeah. ask for anything better or anything more here, Gord. We do appreciate it. And uh, I know the chat does as well. But uh, thank you very much for calling in tonight. And Gord, what, what did you say? You guys have holidays? Is that what's going on? Yeah, so we have national, there's tons of national holidays. That's a good thing about the country being so old and having, uh, has so many holidays. But yeah, we're off today. It's middle of the week Wednesday, but perfect timing for the Leaf game. So yeah, it's solid. not bad. Yeah. All right, Gordon. Well, yeah. thanks for calling in here tonight. I appreciate it. You enjoy the rest of your holiday. Okay. Enjoy the rest of your week. And uh, let's hope for a different result tomorrow night against the Caps. All right. Thanks for having me. Take care. Go Leafs, go. Thanks, Gordon. Appreciate it. Go Leafs, go. There you go. A uh, couple callers here tonight. We've got an hour and 22 minutes. We'll start to wrap this one up here as well. Uh, in the future, if anybody wants to call in, I gotta find, we'll find a better way to maybe reach out, especially if some of you guys don't have some of the social platforms or whatever. But uh, Twitter, you can message me on there at Zach Phillips, Z A C K P H I L L. You can message me on Instagram at Zach Phillips, Z A C K P H I L L I P S underscore. Send me a message. I'll send you guys a link. Uh, if you already have me on Discord, you can send me on there. I don't use it that much. Mostly just use it to message you guys and get people onto the call. So that's the best best method of communication for me right now. Uh, to do some of that. Uh, send messages. I'm happy to take calls from anybody. I don't care who you are. I don't care if you watch the team. Uh, if you played at a high level, I don't care if you watch the team a lot. If you watch the team a little, if you've got thoughts, you've got opinions, and you've got stuff you want to get off your chest, this is the place to do it. You can do it in the chat, but you can also do it by calling in and letting people know, asking me questions, whatever it is. Uh, you call in, I'm happy to hear from people. We got a couple things left before we can wrap up this show. Again, if you haven't hit the like button already, please hit the like button. We're 18 away from 100 right now. Let's just get to 100. Why not? Get to 100. Why not us? Two things before we can close this show out here tonight. First, play of the game. Play of the game for me, uh, I think it's going to be the Bertuzzi goal. There was just, it was pretty cool to watch like how that one started and was able to finish. Um, Lilligren is able to keep the puck in at the point, makes a safe play, not trying to force it through all the traffic in front in the middle of the ice there. It was pretty clogged up, fires it over to the side over the, at the boards, goes down in, in around behind the net into the corner. Tavares picks that one up, starts heading himself up the wall as he does that. Morgan Riley coming down the opposite way. Uh, I, I just think that like 
that was a great use of space, great use of the ice, great activation from the defenseman to get involved there. It, it made it a whole lot more difficult for the Flyers to kind of track everything that was going on. While that movement is happening, while those guys are, are mixing things up and, and confusing the Flyers defensemen who will then all be just all of a sudden basically all started, um, all started puck watching at that point, once they all turned and looked and were just staring, they completely forgot about Tyler Bertuzzi, who was coming in off the bench, who gets himself wide open in the slot. And then he buries. Morgan Riley, a beautiful pass, backhand as he's going behind the net. Not just that, but it's through three defenders who are all staring at him, all puck watching at that point. I think it was great execution. I think it was kind of fun to watch. It was a little bit of like a Globetrotters situation that we got there. I mean, good on uh, good on them for for that play. I thought that was just a that was just a fun one to uh, fun one to watch there. Uh, but yeah, that's gonna be my play of the game. And uh, final thing before we wrap this up, let's get to our grade of the game. You guys send them in the chat as well. You want answers? I think I'm entitled. You want answers! I want the truth! You can't handle the truth! This one's weird. We didn't really touch on it at all with uh, Carter. We didn't touch on it with Gord, but, like, this is the post-game, right? We, we, we hit... This is the post-game, post-game. We hit, what, eight posts as a, as a team, not even including the ones that the Flyers hit, and they hit a bunch here tonight, too. Uh, I was worried that people were going to come to the chat and be like, well, well, if we didn't hit the post, if we didn't hit the post, if we didn't hit the post. Like, no, fuck off. We can't say that. Y you know, you got to put the puck in the net. We can't just be like, well, the posts. And the other thing is like those posts were being hit. This team still played like shit to through like 40 minutes. Like, I don't think that they played well for the first 40 minutes. I was pissed off the way they started. 19 seconds into the game, you're down one nothing. 55 seconds into the second period, another Flyers goal. It's just like, you can't have that. You can't be coming out of the room and just being down one nothing. 19 seconds in, then playing like garbage for the rest of it. Then you come out, and then you're down 2 nothing. 55 seconds into the second period, and you just continue to play like garbage and be like, well... Let's push this one off. We'll get it in the third period. You you go down 0-3, and then it takes a Nylander goal to spark things and get you guys going before anything starts happening. I I mean, that's part of why I'm going to be so low. I think I'm going with like a C plus. Um, if you don't mount a comeback and start to push, then this one's lower. If we don't hit eight posts, which were like some pretty good opportunities that just hit posts, this one is lower. Like. I'm not going to say the excuse of, well, if you didn't hit the post, this one would have been a different story. Like, yeah, sure. But you also just didn't play that well and probably didn't deserve to win. It was just an ugly product that we saw for a while. And fuck, man. I don't know. The name of the game is to put it inside the post. Like, stop hitting them. I I'm going C++ plus because some of those things just bump it up a little bit. But Weird decisions by Keefe, I think, putting those D pairings back together. Brody and Riley, they stunk. Uh, Samsonov was okay, just okay. It's not the reason that he they lost this game, but he could have been better. It, interesting to see how they kind of handle the, the game tomorrow against the Caps, how they handle these, this three-goalie rotation to close out the season now. And we lost our Nick Robertson bet. So it brings that down. But uh, at least at the end of the day, I got to bet it on Bet99, local Canadian sportsbook and ca online casino. Top tier customer service, smooth transactions, fast and easy payouts. That's where you want to be. That's where you want to be betting your money. And I mean, look, don't tell them. Don't tell them. But we're trying to take their money. We've won some money so far this year. Not a crazy amount, but we're up a couple units. We're taking some swings. We're hitting some. We're throwing out some of these big plus money bets. Let's keep it rolling, right? Let's keep it rolling. Let's just keep trying. Back again tomorrow. Bet 99. That's where you want to be betting. 19 plus. Please play responsibly. Available to persons in Ontario only, but that is the, uh, the best. Best place to go. And I see Donnie. Flyers didn't even dress a full team, and Zach gives them a C. Donnie. Next man up. You're looking at that Flyers team saying, well, they didn't dress a full team. I get it, but you knew that they were going to come out firing. 
The Leafs are also missing Marner here. Labushkin comes out. Different lines. Different. No yarn. Croak is playing. You know, there's some stuff going on with this Leafs team, anyways. Reeves left the game. You had to fix it. Fix those lines throughout the rest. I'm not saying Ryan Reeves is like some impact player, but it changes the way that the lines are going to be deployed for the rest of the game as well. Things to take note of. We appreciate everyone who tuned into the game here tonight or to the post game stream here tonight. Thank you for watching. Thank you for supporting. If you haven't already, please hit the like button, subscribe here to the channel, turn on notifications, whatever you got to do to continue to show support so that you don't miss any streams that happen Monday through Friday, 11 a.m. Eastern time. Nick Alberga, Jay Rosehill, they're breaking everything down here on this channel. Breaking down the Leafs, breaking down stories around the league, what the team does, how they're going to go into the things. They, they get a little bit extra time to take away from what happened, calm down a little bit, and then get some of their thoughts out the next morning. We're coming in here raw, we're coming in here hot, and we are absolutely firing away on everything here in this post-game show. So we'll continue to do that throughout the rest of the year. Thanks so much for tuning in. That's going to do it for tonight's show. This is being game number 67 against the Philadelphia Flyers, losing this 4-3. to three. Great effort, come up just short. Great effort, but you come up just short. Feels like that happens a lot with this Leafs team. Thanks so much for tuning in here, guys. This Leafs team moves to now 38-20-9 on the season. We appreciate you. We'll see you back here tomorrow. Keep believing.